Today we'll be exploring some fit questions and we are joined by Sheikh Kayub. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you this morning? Fine, alhamdulillah. Good. Nice to see you. Be Always safe. a pleasure. Always a pleasure, Sheikh. Barakallah. So we have a question regarding adoption. I believe it's from a sister in the UK and it reads, I am blessed to already have a large family and found out that I'm expecting again. My sister, although married for 17 years, has never been able to conceive. I, am I able to allow her to adopt my unborn child when the child is born, inshallah? And it's from a, an anonymous mm, mm. sister in the UK. Is that permissible? Adoption is allowed in Islam. Adoption, we can see it uh, in different forms and shapes. It happened during the time of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, when the Holy Prophet adopted a young man by the name Zaid. And uh, he took very good care of him, of course, he's a prophet. And yes, till yes. Zaid became uh, famous as Zaid, son of Muhammad. Why? Because of good treatment from the Holy Prophet. Now, in order for us to, to be according to the Islamic law, we need to understand few sensitive issues. And this particular uh, question is sensitive. Right. I am allowed to adopt. But after adoption, when the child reaches the age of maturity, buluh, then there will be some restrictions in terms of hijab, which is something very, very sensitive. Imagine a lady has taken care of a boy uh, since when he was young, and then all of a sudden the boys become a balik, then the mother has to cover herself in terms of hijab, not to expose and, uh, hair or whatever, uh, because of this particular son so has come. So she would still be a boy's auntie? So in this scenario, it would be different, though. Would it no. be different? The, because this he's, scenario, because he cannot marry his yeah, aunt. Yeah, this scenario is uh, two sisters, isn't it? Yes, yes, so yes. So yes. the two sisters, yeah, two sisters is uh, easy, because why? The son or a daughter will be a call. nephew by blood, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So of course, it's, uh, he or she will treat the 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 mother who is adopting this particular boy as auntie. So the issue of hijab is not a, 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 a big issue here. But if it was just a good friend who could not conceive and yeah. she wanted her to adopt, yeah, then that yeah. first practice that first ruling would apply indeed she has sorry, to the woman would have, have to cover we have a caller indeed. um sorry sorry all right moment. um sister zainil from london salam alaikum i'm really loving this so much alaikum salam. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. it's really really great that you guys are talking about this and sister Zahra, i particularly like think that you're doing such a great job oh, mashallah and Sheikh your brother Bilal, bless you all mashallah. Um, thank you um my question is about um, fostering. Basically, um, I'm a foster parent, alhamdulillah, and I Mashallah. just wanted to know what Islam says about fostering children. I mean, mostly in regards to the concept of teenage maturity. Um, like, as an example, is it frowned upon? Like, as in, um, obviously, I'm female, and I, I'm fostering um, a young boy, and he's past that age, um, you know, 16 upwards. Is that, I mean, is that a problem to foster children of the opposite gender who have reached that age of maturity and I mean isn't mm. it kind of a good thing to do because obviously it's like you're doing something for that child that doesn't have parents um, mm. or has you know problems at the moment and obviously yeah. Islam tells us to you know do these kinds of things you know help people and even more so because you know as a Muslim I wear a headscarf and everything so I mean I'd be fostering um, mm. and people would I mean a lot of the kids that do come to me as well they're non-Muslim um, and it kind of just opens a gateway sort of to the whole Islamic you know as in them learning about it and things like that but I mm. mean I don't want to compromise my religion at the mm. same time yeah. so I mean I'm you know if I could have your thoughts on on that subject and that would be great and once again thank you much yeah, like for That's doing so this like work and talking about these things it's so important for our community bless you all thank, thank you so yeah, much so sister. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you. yeah um, That's really uh, mm, heartwarming. You know, indeed. Someone's sacrificing their time. Indeed. Uh, and uh, to start uh, the answer uh, to this question, we need to, to, inc to congratulate the sister. Mm -hmm. Because why? Sister Zainab is taking care of a human being. Mm. 
regardless of creed, faith, whatever, you are taking care of a human being. Regardless whether this human being is a child or a teenager, take care of a human being. Not only a human being, even animals, Islam for, uh, encourages us to take care of other beings. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. this particular scenario here, this boy or girl has lost the father and mother. We can't just say, no, because I have my own children. I don't care about fostering. Islam encourages us to take care of children, whether in terms of fostering or adoption, it is something very encouraged for us to, to, to go into that particular uh, way of supporting those who are in need. However, there are a few things which need to, need to be, needs to be looked at here. Number one, the way Sister Zainab has said there, I don't want to compromise with my religion. So she has to adhere to the Islamic principles of jurisprudence when it comes to the relationship between uh, herself and if she is taking care of a boy, so hijab needs to be there. So, Sheikh, so when you say hijab, you're yeah. talking about physical hijab, but if she's, but let me just throw it out there, she's doing a mothering type of role. Yeah. It's not adoption, he's not going to yeah. stay with her forever. Yeah. It be, it's temporary, but she's still extending not just the four walls of her house, but extending her love. Can she cuddle the boy if he's a, you know, he falls over or anything of this nature if he's, if he's, a, he's a child? Or is this compromising her hijab? No, in terms of uh, saving the life of someone who is in danger, mm -hmm. she is allowed to hold, to carry, to... Ha uh, Contact. Contacts, physical contact, yeah, in terms of touching. Yes. It is allowed if there is, for example, a situation where she needs to save or uh, take a hand of this particular boy in order for him to uh, guide or some, something like that. But... In terms of physical hugging, for example. Like he just needs love. He needs missing his mom. Yeah. He's having a teary moment, lump, lump in his throat. He's crying. No, if, if the situation is not of life and, 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 and death situation, then unfortunately, Islam doesn't encourage, doesn't allow uh, the physical contacts. So it's a problematic issue. Because sensitive, you're isn't and it? And very because sensitive. Your instinct, as a you know, as a child, you know, like with a parent when you're in a parenting role, yeah, the child is just you want to put your hand on their shoulder, yeah. you know, just show some kind of affection. Sure. it's unfortunate. And unfortunate. Is it the it's same rule if the child is three, five, ten, fifteen? No, before the age of bulug maturity, you're allowed, but after that, oh, no. Okay, so, okay, okay. I don't uh, know how many uh, teenagers want a cuddle. Um, yeah, unfortunately. <laughs> however, however, recently, well, a younger child. Yeah, recently, yeah. And even teenagers are humans ones. too and need yeah. a cuddle at some time. Recently, in UK, and I think this is a new law. Maybe you can just check. Yeah, that those who are fostering mm. in UK, they are not allowed to cuddle. Why? Because of uh, some issues which happen yeah. with some people. Yeah, yeah, some so yeah. safeguarding health and child safety issues. Child protection child protection yeah, yeah, yeah. A, a, a parent is not allowed to do that but in Islam we are looking at the issues of uh, mahram na mahram and yeah. so on and so forth however to take care of this particular young person it is highly recommended because you are taking care of a human being here mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. so that's that's very important to be looked at Go, going mm -hmm. back to this uh, original scenario so we have the sister that's going to adopt or is wanting to know if she can um, give us a child for adoption to her sister, yeah. her, her own sister. What about her, um, the kind of conversation she needs with her husband? Because does a father have to consent? Is it just advisable? Is the child belong to her because she's carrying the child? Islamically, how does that play out? Yeah, uh, I actually thank you because you, you have reminded me about this particular point, which is very important. A sister is allowed to adopt a sister is allowed to foster, but if she is married, of course, the, the permission from the husband is very important. And this naturally, if two people live together, one cannot decide without the consent, consent or uh, discussing with, if, for example, in this case, husband and wife. So they need to agree that uh, we want to do uh, adoption or fostering together in order for us to, to know what is happening. It is something very uh, encouraging to see that this sister is thinking about another fellow human being. Mm -hmm. My sister doesn't have a child, 
So I'm, I'm, I'm going to do this particular uh, decision because I want her also to have the feeling of a mother the way I have. Very and generous. This in Islam, very generous, yeah, very it, is, it is encouraged because of mm. generosity. We need to spread it within the community. I, I actually know a family that um, two sisters, um, one sister couldn't have, um, she had a daughter and then couldn't conceive, and then the other sister had many children, mashallah, I think nine, and then she had um, twins. So the mm. one of the twins looked like the sister, <laughs> and so she gave that twin to her, to her to adopt, and then she kept the one that looked like her. Yeah. Um, and then when the twin grew up, it was a very difficult situation because the poverty was different, like the level of um, sustenance in the family is different. The, w the child that went into the other, the auntie's family was poorer. Okay. So he struggled in his life, whereas the family he'd left, um, they were more affluent. So mm. there was a lot of resentment um, in that child when, it, when he grew up. That, um, so it's not an easy task to just mm -hmm. say, hand mm -hmm. your child over. Yeah. There's a lot of um, social issues that must be affecting children. Yeah. So I guess that's uh, something that we don't really consider. We think it's very mm. noble, but sure. a lot of implications, aren't there? Sometimes there's a psychological side as well, because you meet yeah. people who have been adopted, mm. and they sometimes, or oftentimes, they can carry a lot of emotions, um, unresolved issues of mm. why would my, I've heard mm. the story, but yeah. I just want to meet my um, parent. Like in this situation, it sounds like it's two sisters, so there will be mm. a family connection anyway. Sure. And you know, these, these things happen where people, uh, uh, you know, a child will go and live with an aunt because say the mum can't afford it, but they yeah. know that's my mum, this is my aunt, but my auntie brings me up like, I'm, she loves me like I'm her own child. Sure. And she sure. doesn't have children. This happens uh, in many cultures, but yeah, w when people are adopted by strangers, and, and you know, at a young age, and they all, uh, they only knew these people <coughs> as their parents. And when they was ten or whatever the time, the parents decided to actually sit them down and say, you know, we're not actually your biological. We love you all the same, but we're not your biological parents. You know, people like this can go through a lot of sure. psychological problems and traumas. Yeah, yeah. Ac actually, Islam says clearly in Surah Al Ahzab, "Udu'uhum li abaihim." Call the children you adopt by the names of their fathers. fathers yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. unfortunately, sometimes when we adopt or we foster children, we change their names. Because my surname is this, I'll give this surname to this particular son or daughter. That's according to Islam is not allowed. Quran says clearly call them by the names of their fathers. So the idea of this young boy or girl, when he or she grows up, and comes to know that, oh, you know what, even my surname is not this, my surname is another one. This causes trouble and problems. So keep the name of the father, biological father, then it will not cause any problems. Of course, the son will ask or the daughter, why my name is this and this family, their name is mm. this particular. Eventually, uh -huh. he will come to know. Uh -huh. So there's a kind of hikmah, not kind of, there's a hikmah in there. there is. So that there's going to be always a seed in a child's mind or... Uh, that these people are not my parents but maybe I don't understand the fullness of mm. it because what happens is I think in sort of uh, the non-Islamic societies where adoption is is quite you know popular and is good although they're always trying to get more people to adopt is that people have a need sometimes it's people who can't conceive yeah and they have a need to have, really want to feel the child is their own psychologically yeah so they may get the child from a very <coughs> young age and not want to tell the child and have that family home and that's family situation like and then they and then later on child's in their teens or something and then they the two parents have this we need to tell them no we don't yes mm. we do and mm. it becomes yeah indeed tricky that, that's it can become very yeah. tricky and and maybe to to advise the people who have changed the names of their the children yeah sometimes they ask what can we do now it's been quite a long time i think they need to go according to the holy quran clearly the Quran says, call them according to their, the names of their parents. Yeah, yeah. They Jeffrey, need to go back to that. Sorry, can I just ask you a final question before we're going to finish? We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so you said the name of the child should be referred to as the biological father. In non-Islamic societies, we know children can be bred outside of marriage. Yeah. And born, sorry, without um, the parents being married. So you, you adopt a child who perhaps is born not with the father's name on the registered birth certificate. We don't know who the father is. Is it permissible for someone, a family, to adopt a child, maybe a Muslim? And uh, I actually knew somebody f many years ago, the, the girl was born, um, the little girl was born in a situation like that. Is it allowed for a Muslim family to um, adopt a child that may be illegitimate? Yeah, sure. Here we are talking about taking care of a human being, taking care of a child. So yes, they can adopt. And what, whichever name is there, 
they need to take that as the name of this particular uh, child. But uh, not to refrain, not, not to take care of a child because why maybe the child is born out of wedlock, it's not advisable. We need mm -hmm. to, to think about well-being of this young one. And the gunah, the sin, the haram which was committed by the father and mother shouldn't affect this particular young one. We need to show that we care and we need to take care of them. Sure. So we're going to take a break now and when we're back, 